Um, I'm obviously delighted to welcome uh, this evening our guest, uh, Professor Rebecca Yar from the Royal Botanic Gardens in Edinburgh. So Becky is a, a lichen biodiversity scientist at the Royal Botanic Gardens, uh, responsible for research into lichens from an evolutionary perspective. Um, she studied botany um, at UC Davis as an undergraduate and, and then went on to get a PhD from Duke University. Then she worked as a research assistant for the California Native Plant Society and, and then um, at the Archbold Biological Station in Florida. After that, she moved to Scotland, taking up a research fellowship at St Andrews before moving to Edinburgh and the Royal Botanic Gardens there in 2006. Um, we'll get a sense of her research in her talk, but essentially it's around understanding the diversity of lichens using a range of tools from inventory and biogeography to population genetics and the structure of symbiotic relationships. She's been vice president and president of the British Lichen Society, is a member of the British Mycological Society and is an editor of the Lichen Lichenologist and the Edinburgh Journal of Botany. Uh, she teaches lichen biology and species interactions at the graduate level and lichen identification for the public and serves currently as the co-chair of the uh, IUCN Lichen Specialist Group. So it's a real pleasure to have you here, Becky. Um, we look forward to your talk, uh, which is entitled A Future for Fungi lichens, the environment, and current conservation. So if you'd care to share your screen. Becky. All right, very good. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, thanks, Paul, for inviting me and for the RSB for having me tonight. I appreciate that. Um, I was asked to give a talk about lichens, the environment, and current conservation, which is kind of a lot, really. So I decided to be a little bit selective of that and give you a short tour of these topics from the point of view of my work at the Botanic Garden in Edinburgh. And I'm going to start with fungi generally. I understand from Keith that you guys don't get a lot of fungal talks, actually. So maybe the last one was a few years back. And fungi get a bit of a bad rap, don't they? In the UK and in the US as well, where I'm from, there's no tradition of foraging. There's, there's also a bit of a deep suspicion. Think about most of the literary references to fungi that you know. They're moldering, they're rotting, they're decaying. They're symbols of these kinds of negative things. And even our esteemed science journals, unfortunately, um, have been criticized for their negative attitudes about fungi and the way they're portrayed on their cover articles, for example, like these shown. So they have been published, um, criticized, I should say, but perhaps the, the letter that wasn't published by Nature got wider readership on Twitter than it would have in Nature anyway. Despite this, though, and recently, fungi are certainly having a moment in the spotlight. You have probably all seen this. This was an article that landed in my lap on a metro bus in Edinburgh not very long ago. And the more predictable titles like uh, The Guardian or the RSPB magazines carry feature articles about fungi lately. And now they're even the subjects of highly produced movies and series on television. So this is all new, really. Thanks to hard work by dedicated, dedicated scientists, though, who study fungi, the journal Science Now has recently given way and given top spot to a network of researchers who, whose own network mirrors the network of the fungi that they're interested in studying and protecting that grow underground in forests. And so some of you may recognize the people who've developed this network. Merlin Sheldrake on the right has recently published a popular science book called Entangled Life. And on the left, for those scientists among you, you may recognize the name, if not the face of Toby Kears. She has done some really elegant experiments about how symbioses work. So these two and others have joined forces to form this Society for the Protection of Underground Networks, SPUN, and they're making uh, quite a lot of hay about this right now, which is exciting. It's timely given the public interest, but it's also um, important because there's a, there's a general and remarkable neglect about fungi from the point of view of con conservation. So I'm really pleased that, um, that this is getting the cover article of science and that these networks are growing in terms of people as well. So I know there may be some botanists among you who 
probably decry this idea of plant blindness. Hopefully that's not something that's completely foreign to your ears, but just spare a thought for a fungi which have microscopic lifestyles, um, at least partly or completely. And it's really easy to overlook them, yet they have this huge importance in ecosystems. So the talk tonight then is going to be in three parts. Uh, the first part I'm calling a fungi fest, just to give you a little bit of fun about fungi, what they are, how they work a little bit like that. Um, and then I'll give you some trends from my research. So past research, present research and future research, bringing together some different themes um, across time. And then my last section is about big initiatives, really. It's technology and transform transformative biology, these big initiatives that bring lots of people together that are doing really important work. So I'll introduce you to some of those initiatives that I'm involved with through the Royal Botanic Garden. So let's just start with our fantastic fungi. You'll all recognize fungi in nature, right? From the recyclers of the forest, like this fairy ring on the left, to the, um, to the symbionts of our trees so this beautiful mushroom is connected to the roots of the trees in the forest around us to the lichens like this can you guys see my my mouse yeah great um so there's a nitrogen fixing lichen that some people don't like in their lawns i'm always really pleased to see it um and then some people are just fascinated to be photographers and and have a passion for how beautiful lichens are in their various guises they grow as fine thread-like cells. You can see them on, unfortunately, sometimes in your fruit bowl or on your bread. Um, but they also produce this stunning array of sizes and shapes and colors. And it's really rivaled only by the more stunning diversity of ways which they kind of get along in life from, from being symbionts and mutualists of plants, especially. They could be living without oxygen in the guts of animals, living cryptically in soil and water. Um, and very often, they're symbionts. They reproduce by microscopic spores. I hope I can make that happen. Yes. Sometimes with vegetative or clonal fragments too. And they've invented myriad ways of, of basically being fruitful and multiplying uh, and by developing over evolutionary time, lots of ways of increasing their surface area to make those spores. So here's gills, wrinkles, tubes, all sorts of different ways of making lots of surface area. And some of them will reproduce Many of them will reproduce asexually as well by making structures like these or little powdery dots. And yes, even by taking over the, the brains of insects, making them climb up high before the fungus will sporulate. This little fungus on the right hand side that I that I made puff, um, I couldn't make that happen again. Can I make it happen again? No, sorry about that. Um, it, it releases its spores with um, changes in humidity. So you can make that, you can do it yourself, which is good fun. But of course, fungi, it's not about all about beauty and um, excitement from the photographers and evolutionary innovation. It's also really big business. So the economics of fungi probably starts with this figure, $900 billion a year for a single fungus. So that's the brewer's yeast. And that's 5% of the US GDP. It's a figure mirrored in the UK as well. And these little tiny humble yeast cells provide the powerhouse for brewing, for baking, for wine, for making bioethanol, for making yeast derived insulin, a single little tiny microscopic fungus. And if you're interested in that fungus, then there's a book um, by Nicholas Money that's out called The Rise of Yeast, which I would recommend. There's a recent review paper out which highlights the amazing potential of fungi. That's their title. It's not just me being all excited about this. Lots of people are. And the title harkens back, I love this, to uh, 50 ways of Paul Simon, right? So we've got 50 ways of, of making fungi useful for humans. And the authors highlighted these six themes on the left-hand side for um, enzymes, but other products against human disease. You've all heard of penicillin, but how many know that the statins that you or your relatives are taking are a fungal-derived product as well? Or cyclosporin, which is another fungal-derived product. Fungi have been doing a lot of things for a lot of time in a, micro, in a microbial war underground oftentimes, and they're making really interesting chemistry and humans can take advantage of that. So this image on the slide shows lots of ways that fungi are involved in our lives without you probably even realizing it from, um, what do you call it, stonewashed clothing to textile dyes, pulp and paper making, all of the foods, lots of catalysts, biopout, you know, the list is tremendous. And that that doesn't even start against um, talking about the fungi we use as biocontrols. 
for the fungi we use as inoculum for enhancing crops and forestry for obviously food and beverages which you know about and i love this one of their themes was saving the planet so that might be slightly aspirational but actually the the uh the topics that they chose for that were really interesting so waste disposal bioremediation biofuels and plastic digestion coming soon to recycling centers near you so the range of these compounds that fungi produce and that we can take advantage of is pretty tremendous and that's just the fungi that we know so this is a black slide it's not a mistake that black slide is all about what we call fungal dark matter so fungal biologists who are interested in diversity recognize that there are a lot of fungi out there and we can sense them in various ways. We can detect them by sequences. We can see the signatures of their activity, but we haven't described them. We've only described about 120,000 species so far. And that little yellow corner of my slide up here, this is the described fungal diversity. Those tiny words say describe fungal diversity and to scale, that's the estimated fungal diversity. So we've probably got about 3% of what we think are out there described. There've been a lot of tries at, at actually kind of coming up with that number of how many fungi there really are, and we don't know. Uh, but the consensus is it's a low figure of the millions. So three to five million, something like that. And I think that's probably surprising for a lot of people. You know, that's a huge number. <laughs> okay, so let's move on to theme two, which is about um, trends in lichen research. So my first story is about biodiversity loss. And it's really this question of who made it through the transition to industrialization. We all live in this post-industrial world and we see fungi around us all the time. But what did we lose on that transition from before industrialization to now? And we we're lucky at the Royal Botanic Garden to be able to do a project about this um, using a new sort of archaeological resource, which I'll introduce you to. So before I do that, though, I realize I haven't really told you what lichens are, so I better do that first. What are they? They're symbiotic fungi. Lots of fungi, I've mentioned this, are symbiotic. They are made of little filamentous cells. And this picture on the right hand side, you can see lots of layers. It's a fantastically complex structure for something that's just made of little tubes, right? And everything you see in the picture except this layer of green stuff is fungal. So the layer of green stuff, of course, is single celled algae that are wrapped up with fungal threads. And that's the carbon source, the food source of the fungus. They grow their food in their body. Very clever. And it's a quite a complicated structure. It's a protective structure. This pinkish surface layer is a chemical deposited by the fungus as a UV screen. This sort of opaque layer that's gray in the middle is an air filled layer to promote gas exchange for photosynthesis the blackish part below is melanin just like you and i have melanin so do they so they have these diverse chemicals which they use to protect and promote their symbionts and for all other things that we don't even know about yet but they also importantly obtain their mineral nutrients from atmospheric deposition they get their carbon from their photobiont we call it their algal or al sometimes a cyanobacterial partner inside their bodies, but anything else that lands on them goes in, and if it's useful, they'll use it. But also it means that if something lands on them that's dangerous, they can't do anything to protect themselves. They don't have a waxy cuticle the way plants do. They don't have um, oily skin the way animals will, or fur. So when we think back to the pre-industrial period in Britain, uh, we can imagine a couple of things. So first of all, most of the people live outside cities. Here are some people living outside the city and beating on trees to knock the acorns off for their pigs. So the land management that used to go on in this pre-industrial time was probably fairly low intensity. I mean, you've got farming, you've got um, coppicing to, to make fodder for their animals or to produce round wood that they could use for building. But as we move through the industrial revolution and beyond, we end up with a really different landscape. People move to cities the population proliferates and the air quality drops off significantly. This is London in the great smog of 1952. This individual event killed thousands of people. It's really dangerous for people, but also for lots of other creatures too. So to introduce this project a little bit more, I'm gonna give you a time, timeline. On the left-hand side, you've got a timeline down here. That's us, 2023, going back in time. And one of the most substantial things, significant events in the history of biology, really, is this, the publication of Systeme Naturae by Carl Linnaeus. That was in 1735. And after the publication of that, 
we get the foundation of a whole new field of syst systematics and taxonomy. And here, this chart plots the rise of taxonomists. So that didn't really exist before this um, idea of putting things in a systematic order. So here we have the start of taxonomy as a science way back here in 1735. But unfortunately, that happened pretty much just at the same time as industrialization started to happen across Western Europe, especially in the bigger cities. That's a little bit unfortunate. And as a result of industrialization, people moved into cities, population rose, uh, land management changed, and the resource use skyrocketed. And as a result of that, uh, according to the World Wildlife Fund here, this is the Living Planet Index, which is a report published every year. They track populations of organisms over time. And this is uh, this plot is about 32,000 populations of about 5,000 species over all the world. And the population numbers are going down 70% overall, which is a massive decline in, um, in, in our wildlife. So that's important. And it was recognized as important. And so most industrial and not just industrial, but civilized, I should say, nations in, on Earth got together. And all the countries that um, were signatories to the Convention on Biological Diversity are now uh, bound by law in many cases to try to protect the biodiversity that they have. That was in 1992. So there's some action to try to counteract this. We've got targets to try to meet, to try to reach those which are ambitious and not always met. But it begs the question, doesn't it, of, well, we had we didn't have any taxonomists before this happened with the imp the impact of human population expansion and land management changes has been massive but we have no information very much at all about what was going on in that pre-industrial era except that we do so those of you who ever traveled or maybe even live in southern england for part of the year know about these old houses and these old houses were built from the things that they could access locally i met a thatcher uh, during this project, who said these houses were built from the things you could see from the ridge line of your roof. They used round wood from hazel coppice to build their wattle and daub panels. All these white panels are built like this with sticks and mud. The timbers, of course, were hewn from local trees and hewn roughly. And with the collaboration of Chris Ellis and Brian Coppins from the Botanic Garden, we decided to have a look in the attics of these places to see if any of that wood and bark still existed to see if the lichens were preserved there or any epiphytes for that matter. So the field work was pretty trying Had to go off and have tea with posh people and beers in the local pubs, climb around in the roof spaces and uh, meet some pretty enthusiastic people. Some people actually went to the extent of cutting a hole in their ceiling so that we could get in there and have a look. And what we found was quite a lot of preserved epiphytes in the roofs. So it functions like an herbarium. You've got a dry space. Um, and the things that were cut out of the local woodland persisted on the bark in those uh, roof spaces for all this time, hundreds of years. So the map on the right shows you all the places that we looked. The, the figure on the left shows you some examples of how well preserved these lichens were. Some of them like this, you can recognize that Xanthoria parietina. Some of them um, like that are easier to, to understand than others. But what was always the case was that even if the morphology was challenging, like this one on the top left, this is what it should look like, uh, the spores and the chemistry was all preserved. So we could identify a huge proportion of what we collected. And from that, we were able to infer the historic biodiversity of these places. And so I'll show you some examples of the species we found. Here's one, Calaplaca ferruginia. These little orange dots was found in 17th century timbers in Cambridgeshire. And if you look at the modern distribution from the British Lichen Society, you can see these black dots are where it's found today. It's a very different picture. And if you plot the mean annual temperature of the current distribution places, you'll find it looks something like this. Here's the 95% confidence interval for that, for the climatic preference in terms of temperature of the species in the modern landscape. But, my mouse is in the wrong place. So this village here, Comberton is where we found it, has a very different um, climate now, two degrees warmer on average, which is a massive change you probably are familiar with, how much that means in terms of the lifespan of an organism. So it's well outside its climatic optimum now. Climate change is a driver of loss over this period. Here's another example. 
This is uh, Perdisaria liaplaca, so it's looking a little bit worse for wear, but again, the spores were preserved, historically found down here in Essex. And for those of you who have ever looked at a map of modern lichen distributions uh, that responds to pollution, this is what you'll see. This is a classic example of a pollution response. This whole area in the Midlands and down towards the home counties is the worst for pollution. And so this lichen should be widespread across Britain, but, but isn't because of the pollution that's there. So the historic locality here in Coggish Hall, Essex, is well outside the tolerance of its sulfur dioxide um, tolerance, really. So here's the 95% confidence interval for where it can grow today and does grow today in terms of sulfur dioxide limits, but Coggish Hall is much higher than that. So local losses attributed to that. So that's a couple of individual examples. If we look at the data set all together, we can infer the drivers of loss for the entire thing. And one thing I'd just like to point out is that if we're looking at a historic sample and, it, and we don't find a species there, there's absolutely nothing we can say about that. So that's intractable. But if we found something in the historic samples, but that's absent in the present day, we can infer a loss, right? And how do we infer that loss? We have to do it statistically, don't we? So what we do is we use our sample location. We use the density of um, records of current distribution around that to infer a threshold, a likelihood of probability for the occurrence of that species in that landscape now. And using those statistical thresholds, we infer something like this about the amount of loss. 35 to 80% losses. Let those numbers sink in for a minute. Just choose your whatever your organism group is that you love and you know in your local patch. And now imagine 80% of it is gone. It's a really stark, huge figure. And part of it is due, um, well, I'll tell you what it's due to. And a lot of it is down to this pollution thing that we just mentioned. So especially in Essex, if you look at the sulfur dioxide optimum of the species that were lost, which is what this is, these villages are higher than that. So pollution has a huge role to play in this. But what's also interesting is that we also can infer a role for the effect of a woodland nearby. So the, the extent of ancient woodland nearby might even have a tempering effect. So the species that were lost um, have in, in, in Wiltshire, for example, there weren't as many lost there. And we think that's because Wiltshire has such extensive ancient woodlands. And so there's a really interesting interplay between these different factors. I'd like to just go back quickly to this living planet index and break it down by geography briefly. So our population trend that we looked at before was minus 69%. In Europe and Central Asia, that is 18%. It's much lower in Europe and Central Asia. And the reason that is, is because this figure only goes back to 1970. The baseline is 1970. Well, what about all those species that didn't make it through the industrial period? And so we're, if we're gonna think about reconstruction and re um, rebuilding our populations that, were, that are declining now, we're gonna be missing all those things that were lost already. So the big declines are happening now in the global south. Those big population losses are happening where industrialization is much later. And that's not something that's been talked about is enough, basically. So let's move to the present. Here's a present um, challenge for us in the mountains. So the, this is a picture of a snowbed from the Cairngorms showing the outer edge where vascular plants become competitive. This dashed line shows where the vac vascular plants can get a hold in. And a snowbed is a place where snow lies so late that the growing season is really short, so short that vascular plants can't effectively grow there. And bryophytes, mosses and liverworts and lichens are the dominants. But you can also imagine that on the tops of our mountains, climate is changing there too. And we have a homogenizing effect from pollution there as well. So these are really, um, highly endangered habitats and we don't even know what's up there. So one of the things we wanted to do was do a bit of inventory work in the montane zone. This is a satellite image of the Cairngorms with some of the high peaks shown in black. Cairngorm and Ben McDewey are there. Maybe you've been there. Over a series of a couple of um, field seasons, I did some inventory work up there and some of the early returns were incredibly exciting. This tiny chip of rock right here sitting on a 20p coin was one of the first things to come back. And it had two species on it, which were completely surprising. One, 
had not been seen in 40 years and was thought to be extinct, Bellamaria alpina. And this one, Sporostatia testudinia, hadn't been um, collected except for twice. Now, if you look at all these pins, my blue pins on this map, all those two species are all over the place up there. It's just that either they've appeared since 40 years ago, or they've just not been looked for enough or in the right places. And the latter two are just as likely as the form as as the other explanation for there's just not been a lot of work. It's hard. They're long days, they're hard days, and you have to have quite a lot of expertise to um, to be able to identify this stuff. The other thing we're doing in the mountains then is um, using all the skills we can throw at it to identify things, and that includes barcoding. And barcoding is a technique that I'll introduce you to, which is a way of using uh, short sequence data, uh, DNA sequences for identification. And I'll introduce that using this image. So barcoding essentially envisions being able to identify biological sample, any biological sample using a short and diagnostic DNA sequence, one or two genes. The idea is you take a bit of material like this, you extract its DNA, you generate that short sequence, which looks like this when it comes off the machine, and it just consists of a series of A's and T's and G's and C's, and you line those things up so that you can uh, compare them better. And then you deposit them in a sequence depository system like this, the barcode of life data system, for example. And for people like me, one of my jobs is to populate a reference database like that with well-identified material. And the reason is because if I want to, um, if I want to, you, if, well, I can identify a fair amount of stuff, but a lot of people can't. And so here's an example of an unidentified specimen here, this question mark. But the, the point is that a non-expert can generate a DNA sequence a lot easier that they can learn to be a lichenologist effectively, right? So non-experts can use that database for identification. And in this days, it's definitely easier to find somebody who can generate those DNA sequences than identify organisms. And so what we have in the barcode of life data system is over 11 million barcode sequences, which is an awful lot. And it's about two to 4% of all the known fungi. It's not a lot. So it's important for people who have expertise to be populating those reference databases with additional specimens that are well identified. And I use them too for um, testing my own hypotheses about what species are. So I might think, well, is it species C or is it species D? I'll just go ahead and barcode it and see which one it is. So those query sequences can be matched, which is a really useful tool. Now we have, um, we're really lucky to have a new barcoding technician in our lab. Amanda Jones has just joined us and she's going to be barcoding those 300 samples from the Cairngorms and we're really lucky to have that. But if we think about montane lichen diversity, we can do an inventory of poorly explained habitats. We can create reference barcode libraries, which are useful for us and for other people. But we can also do interesting stuff with those barcodes. And, and one of them is for an example of understanding management. So we can use them to explore diet. So we're gonna apply, <clears throat> excuse me, a, a barcoding data for, to practical problems like understanding the diet of these reindeer. They're a wonderful herd up there, managed well by the Cairngorm Reindeer Company. Nobody wants to get rid of them, but we would like to understand the impact of those animals on these um, delicate habitats. So what we did is we had these crack team working with us to um, do a feeding trial. Ailey and John helped with the feeding trial and Linda's been helping with the analysis. And we collect reindeer poo and then we sequence the uh, plants and fungi out of them to see what they've been eating. And it works remarkably well. We've got free ranging animals shown in blue, uh, eating a little bit of birch, uh, some, some something that's not matching very well that took us a little bit more work there i'm not sure why a p is in there in the in the early animals the first few days lots of heather uh, some brambles too and some lichens but the feeding trial shows up to be really really different so this is underway now with there's more exploration of the data that requires doing but it's clear that this proxy for diet um, in terms of numbers of sequences for those cairngorms animals is a really useful technique to look at diet and it's used um, for lots of other dietary studies for animals too. Our last story then for the research right now is, um, is about future predictions. And this is for the rainforest. So rainforest is also having a bit of a moment. I hope all of you have now heard of temperate rainforests. 
Did you know Scotland has rainforest? It's rare on a global scale. It's under threat. It needs protection. So you can read all those things on the Alliance for Scotland's Rainforest tweet here. This is their pinned tweet. This is a consortium of a whole bunch of different people from um, experts in the fields of lichens and bryophytes and fungi to managers like the Woodland Trust and RSPB um, and Nature Scott and other organizations as well who are concerned with this important habitat. There's not much of it left. There's only about 30,000 hectares and it's pretty small fragments. Some of them are in dire condition with lots of invasive plants like rhododendron. But it's, it's becoming more uh, visible as a is conservation issue for sure. There's a new book about it and it's a really important habitat. And I'll tell you more about that briefly. But I first wanna just tell you a little bit about lichen diversity in the UK which looks like this. So us lichenologists, we have to watch out for about 2000 species of lichens and then another about 600 of fungi that grow on lichens that aren't, or like they're not exactly lichens themselves. So let's just keep that 2000 number in mind. We've got lots, lots of lichens to watch out for. And the conservation evaluation for those UK lichens is a little bit out of date from 2012, but it's indicative for sure. And we have about 60% of our lichens listed as least concern. Populations are stable. They're not under threat. We don't have to worry about them. There are some that are threatened or near threatened. We've got some we just don't know anywhere near enough about. So there's plenty of work to be done. But the one I want to highlight here is this IR or international responsibility. So the bars in orange show species for which Great Britain and Ireland support more than 10% of the extant European or even the world populations of these fungi. So that's a lot of species. It's, it's 170 odd species that we have important responsibility for. And there's at least 34 endemic species in that list. And the reason I'm bringing it up now is because in the temperate rainforests, some of these things that are least concerned for us are actually of a huge concern on a global scale. So what is a temperate rainforest? They've got high humidity, year-round mild temperatures, and they're globally really rare. 1% of all land on Earth is a temperate rainforest. People don't talk about them much because they're rare, um, but they also have really high epiphyte diversity. So about half of, our, of Great Britain and Ireland's international responsibility species of lichens occur in the temperate rainforests. You can see one here, this black stuff. There's another one here. They're plastered with it. These hazel trees are plastered with it. And they've got all kinds of interesting biology that we won't go through. And so if we're thinking about the resilience of temperate rainforest, what will it be like in the future? How do we protect it going forward? We really need to understand the landscape scale dispersal of these rare species and international responsibility species. Uh, especially in the face of woodland expansion, because as you all know, one of the big ways for fighting carbon dioxide emissions is to draw carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and tree planting has been proposed as one of the ways to do that. So we've got to do it wisely. It has to meet lots of different needs for lots of different groups. And it's not just about carbon dioxide. If it's the wrong tree in the wrong place, it's not going to work. So I'll introduce you to a PhD project by Sally Eaton that was done here at the Botanic Garden in cooperation with Nature Scott. And it was about dispersal of some of these rainforest lichens. And the idea is to take a, a source tree covered with um, interesting and rare species of lichens that's isolated from others and put air samplers near it. So these air samplers have little bars that whiz around fast. They're covered in Vaseline and they impact spores or other little propagules as they move through the air quickly. And then we can sample that Vaseline uh, and amplify the DNA out of it and use a barcoding approach to identify who's in there and how many there are. And these air samplers, you can see them going off into the distance here. They were put out in an array that looks like this at different radii from a source tree. And based on the number of propagules that were trapped in each of those locations, you can build a model of how far they disperse on average. And not only that, but Sally used um, local landscape features about the trees and the way the landscape was structured to build a model about um, how long it takes in years for trees to be colonized. And because of her dispersal estimates, we can, you can 
infer how far away a tree has to be from its source to get colonized. And these ones that are 500, 250, 100 meters away from a colonized tree, they really don't get colonized much at all, and not even for over 100 years. At 100 meters distance, it's an effective barrier. But at less than 100 meters distance, these three different lines at 125 and 50 meters, you can see that colonization happens, takes a while. 60 years on, you still have only about 40 trees colonized in a landscape like the one where the model was built. And that, interestingly, is for this species, Loberia pulmonaria, which is a bit of a weed where this study took place. So just let me just let me pause for a, bit, a minute about the species. So the curious case of the lungwort. So this is it. This is its distribution in the UK, and it's informative because if you look at the green squares, those are old records. They've been searched for and not been refound. And most of them are in the east, you'll notice. The more modern records in blue and in red are much more Western in distribution. So there's a climatic effect here, but there's also a woodland loss effect. And what's interesting is to compare these distributions with that in Europe. So this species is incredibly rare across most of Europe. It's red listed in several countries. Its generation time has been studied in detail in Switzerland. They know every tree it grows on, and it takes about 30 years for it to um, have a generation in, in Switzerland. And that's kind of analogous to our eastern areas where, where it's, it was used in Britain too as an old woodland indicator, but only in the east. And it still is an old woodland indicator in the east. So you can find patches of it in really beautiful old bits of woodland in the east. When you go west, in Scotland especially, it becomes a bit weedy. And in fact, its generation time is as rapid as seven years. So that's also Sally Eaton's data. And that's really interesting. So even a species that functions kind of like a weed still takes 60 years to get from a tree, you know, 50 meters away to the next one along. And that's true of these other species that are out there too. So this model was used to uh, study the effects, of the, um, the biology of some other rainforest species. And this a very similar picture emerges. Uh, there's definitely a barrier somewhere between 150 meters and these species are just not good at getting around. We're not sure why that is, but there's a lot of old growth species, which we think are just poor dispersers, um, either poor disperser or poor establishment. And that same pattern of, of poor dispersal seems to be apparent um, for different species that aren't that closely related. What's also apparent is that you have a difference in management scenarios. So in her model, she could, she could model the difference between low management, where you use the same kind of tree components and com community that's there now, as opposed to a high management scenario where you promote hazels and ashes, which tend to be the species of tree that most of the rainforest lichens um, prefer and have their biggest populations on. And so what we see is that the most successful movement in the landscape happens under this scenario of having lots of hazel and ash, which is pretty sad because we're losing our ash trees really rapidly. So we at least here have a way of modeling where those trees need to be in the landscape, how close they need to be to other source trees to promote these rare species in the landscape going forward. And that's really important. Okay, so our last theme then is about technology and transform transformative biology. And I'm going to show you a couple of big initiatives like these two, and then I'll tell you a little bit about conservation at the end. So the first one, the International Barcode of Life, you've all heard a lot about barcoding a lot tonight, haven't you, is a huge initiative. So this it, RBG is a partner with a lead on the plants, and uh, it's 70 partners across Europe from 30 countries. It's huge. And we're in the second phase of this project. So the first phase was about species discovery, and it was focused on areas where the infrastructure for this barcoding already existed. This is not a new continent. You didn't know about this is Costa Rica, by the way. It's tiny, but it's here. And the first phase was about uh, building barcode reference libraries. Lots and lots of specimens were collected and barcoded in that first phase. This new phase, the bioscan phase, is really about ramping up species discovery populating those reference databases and accelerating studies of species dynamics. And we're doing that by bulk sampling and what we call meta barcoding. So that's like the air sampling where you take a bulk sample and you can barcode lots of different things at the same time. 
And in the long run, this project is really ambitious. The idea is to have lots of bulk samples to study species dynamics. And, and they, they call it a planetary biodiversity mission. And the real reason that they're doing this is because we want trend data. We don't have good trend data for most organisms. So this World Wildlife Fund report and the Living Planet Index is fantastic. 5,000 species, they're calling them wildlife, not just because it's the World Wildlife Federation, but because both basically it's all animal data. There's very little, if any, plant or and no fungal data in there at all. And using um, projects like this and the data that are generated, we'll be able to add information on species trends to these studies to these groups where we just don't have the trend data. So it's really important. The next one, I'm going to transition now from barcoding to genomes. And for those of you who don't think about this every day, um, I have to thank Michelle Hart for this brilliant analogy she came up with for COVID. I just heard, I think it was yesterday, that in China, you no longer have to have a PCR test to get into to China. So what's a PCR test? It's a, it's a barcode. You're looking for a single sort of signature gene that tells you you've got COVID. So that tells you what you have. But if you want to know what actual uh, strain of COVID you have, then you'll have to look at its genome. And the genome is that full sequence of every single A, T, C, G, and C, all the instructions to build a whole new virus in this case. And, um, and so that's the next level of organizational information up is the genome, all that data all together. And then we use this word genomics, which is the study of the genome. It's not only what genes are there, but how do they interplay with each other and their environment and other organisms? And genomics is what is used bioinformatically, sort of using computer technology to look at those interactions among genes and how they inter interact with um, their hosts, for example. So this is the difference between barcoding you got what it is to what is it going to do to you? And this is what the Darwin Tree of Life project is all about. This is another big consortium and it involves um, natural history organizations like museums, uh, botanic gardens like Kew and the botanics to do the collecting of organisms to generate genomes. And the whole idea is to generate genomes with Great Britain and Ireland as the study area. And the ambition is huge to generate reference genomes, and I'll tell you what that means in a minute, for many, many, many examples of life in the UK. So we're looking for 20,000 genomes over the course of this project. And it um, has lots of partners, including Sanger, who do the sequencing, um, Earlham does a lot of the sequencing, and then some bioinformatics folks as well. So this is a huge, ambitious project. Here's just a little tally of what the uh, goals look like. So across the top, we've got families and genera and species of the organisms that live in the UK. And here are there's organism groups, kelps and diatoms, fungi, animals, plants and protozoa. And all Earth taxa, we've got about 10,000 families of life. And unbelievably, almost half of them live in the UK. So using the UK as a, as a study system is pretty good in terms of representation. And right now the target is this, 20,000. So we're going to have, hopefully get genomes for all of those guys. Already they've built this fantastic pipeline that takes you from a, an actual organism sample to a validated identification using a barcode, to the sequence, to the assembly of the sequence, to the curation and the addition of the names of the different genes and the, and the amount of information that's there from, um, from doing comparative studies of gene finding and features and then all of that gets published on an open portal and this does this is something that everybody everyone's lab does that for themselves each time but if you're going to be generating 20,000 reference level genomes you have to be able to do this at scale and they've managed to make this pipeline that's exportable and will be transported and is shared with other um, initiatives like this around the world so that's already an important output just doing this and here is um, some of the early results. This slide is only a few months old and it's already out of date. This is sort of like a tree of life, but not really a tree of life. It just shows you all the different organism groups that have been sampled from the protists to the green plants to the fungi, and then all the rest of this is animals. And the early samples were mostly insects. They're easy to sequence, it turns out. And during COVID, you could 
you could sample insects from your backyard with a moth trap basically was what was happening during COVID. So a lot of the early results came from moth traps in people's backyards when we couldn't do field work. Um, so the blue bars that stick up from each of these um, little terminals on the trees. So those are sampled families that are in progress and the red ones are already published. So already a hundred genomes are out of this. And that is, that's already quite out of date. We're up to 200 and we're looking at a thousand this year. So it's quite exciting. And, and what is a genome but a list of letters, right? So this is a nice figure that Mark Blackster, who's one of the PIs on the project, built. Um, just a bunch of A's and T's and G's and C's. And if you published it as a book, well, it would be hundreds of volumes if you printed this thing out. And it's no use to anybody as a wall of books. But when it's annotated and when it's um, compared with other like genomes or compared with um, other data sets, then the uses of these things are sort of only limited by scientists' imagination. When the human genome was published about 25 years ago, I don't think people thought we would end up with personalized medicine in the way that we already have. So 25 years is about the incubation period. I can't wait to see what's going to happen then. The last initiative then is about the um, International Union of Conservation of Nature, the IUCN. And if you look at the at the progress of fungal red list assessment. So I've, hopefully you all know about red listing. Red listing is a way of assessing a species for its threat level. Um, and I, I should have mentioned that before when I showed you the, the um, conservation assessments of the lichens, but that's what red listing is. It's a conservation assessment. Is this thing okay or is it not okay? And the first fungal red lists were done in 2003. By that time, probably all the birds had almost all been done. And we only had two fungi listed. One of them was this little guy, Clodonia perforata, near and dear to my heart. I listed that thing in 2003. So it's nice that I'm back, back at work with these. And what happened was a whole lot of nothing, really. Um, so this species has actually quite a lot of work on it now because it was red listed. And this other one, Eriodermo pedicillatum, also has had a lot of work. So from that point of view, this is just the first step in conservation is to get some awareness about it. And the next stage of the conservation cycle then is to, to do some actions and that's worked. But the assessments weren't even there for many of many other species until, look at this, it's starting to happen. And what's happening there is that Greg Mueller, Anders Dahlberg and um, Michael Krakorov, who built this website, put together the Global Fungal Red List Initiative. And this has been really wonderful. It's a way of, inviting anybody to contribute to the information for rare species. You too can sign up to the Global Fungal Red List Initiative and contribute whatever information you have on these rare species. And there's different um, specialist groups who are involved in this processing the data. And thanks to this um, initiative, which was launched in 2014, now we're up to 597 and counting. Actually, this year it's going to be 1,000, we think. So it, this is also working really, really well. And that there's a review paper that's out of the first one looking at these fungi and what do they do? Well, 62% of them are mutualists and 30% of them are saprotrophs and four of them are parasites, 4% of them are parasites, mirroring the kind of life histories of fungi out there in the world. And the threatened ones look fairly similar, although it looks like there are fewer mutualists that are threatened than, 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 um, than the ones that are assessed. So the proportions change a little bit. But it's nice to be able to have at least some data to look at and try to try to understand maybe there might be biases in which ones are threatened versus which ones have been assessed. We couldn't do that until now we at least have some data. And now we can do things like this. What kind of habitats do these things grow in? Um, do, the, do the threatened ones, this is all threatened species now in this chart. Are there a lot of forests that are threatened around the world? Yes, there are. But there are other kinds of habitats too. And in these kinds of assessments will help us sort of shine a light on where the where the work needs to be done. So I think there is a future for fungi. There's a lot of initiatives happening right now. There's a place for everybody to get involved. There are specialist groups. There are conservation groups like SPUN, which I introduced you to before, Fungi Foundation, uh, Alliance for Scottish Rainforest, and the specialist societies like the Mycological Society and the British Lichen Society. Some of you are involved, which is wonderful. Um, if you want to be involved in other things, then have a look around. There's a lot to get involved with, and um, I think the future is hopeful. Let's put it that way. So that's all I have for you tonight. Um, thanks to Roz 
and the RSB behind the scenes team, including Keith. So thank you for helping tonight. And thank you all for joining me.